Well, Matthew 7, verse 1 says this, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. <laughs> First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. Verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So here we are in part seven of the Sermon on the Mount. And I wanted to start out by reading that whole passage to you because we're going to be diving into it. And I actually want to take this piece by piece. And we're going to break that whole passage we just read into bite-sized portions. When we read this passage in its entirety, it's pretty easy to dissect the two main themes of what we just read. You can pick them out pretty easily. And matter of fact, most of your Bibles, you have them broken into these sections already. And those two themes are judging and praying. But I want to take some time and we're going to dive deeper into some of the principles Jesus wants his followers to walk away with after hearing such powerful truths. Because like all of that we've heard and studied through Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount so far, there are some absolute golden life-changing nuggets that I want you to understand today. So let's take a look. We're going to look at eight different principles that we can apply to our lives from this teaching that we just read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12. So we're going to start out with this one, right out of the gate. He says, Judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So to this point in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had primarily dealt with themes connected with the interior spiritual life, talking about a lot of internal stuff. That's attitudes and giving, prayer, fasting, materialism, and anxiety over material things, a lot of stuff like that. Now he touches on an important theme related to the way we think of and the way we actually treat other people. With this command, judge not that you be not judged, Jesus warned against passing judgment upon other people because when we do so, we're going to be judged in a similar manner. Another thing to keep in mind is the Greek word for judge is actually this, it's krino, and that can mean to condemn or judge overly harshly. So if you condemn or judge other people in an overly harsh type of manner, God's going to judge you in that same way. So here Jesus teaches us how to conduct ourselves when it comes to the faults and the flaws of other people in our lives. He was specifically aiming a lot of this teaching at the scribes and Pharisees because they were actually known for justifying themselves by condemning other people. And he uses them as an example for his followers on basically what not to do. So now, I don't know about your upbringing. I don't know how you've been brought up in church or in your spiritual uh, growth. But my guess is that most of you listening to this teaching have heard this passage of Scripture before. In many circles, people use this Scripture to almost get out of something. Many unbelievers will use this, for example, if a believer tries to encourage them to change a sinful part of their lifestyle. In other words, among those who don't know a lot about the Bible, this is a verse that seems to be most popular. Yet most of the people who quote this verse don't really understand what Jesus is saying. They seem to think, or in some cases even hope, that Jesus commanded a universal acceptance of any lifestyle or any teaching. An example would be if I went to a friend of mine and said something like, man, you might want to consider how your actions are actually grieving the Holy Spirit. 
And then my friend might say something like, quit judging me, bro. <laughs> like, judge not, bro. Like, whatever the case may be, hey, man, you might want to think about what you're doing, how it's not biblical. Hey, don't judge me. Maybe you've heard that before when you tried to correct a brother or sister in Christ. Hey, I just want to help you understand something. And somebody's really quick to respond back with, hey, judge not. Don't judge me or something like that. I don't want to go too far ahead in the next week's teaching, but just a little later in this sermon, in Matthew 7, verse 15 and 16, Jesus commanded us to know ourselves and others by the fruit that their life is producing. And some sort of assessment is necessary for that. The bottom line of this section is this. A Christ follower is called to show unconditional love, but not unconditional approval. We really can love people who do things that maybe shouldn't be approved of, but if we can have unconditional love, doesn't mean we have unconditional approval. Moving on, the second thing we need to look into is this. For with that judgment you judge, you will be judged. Jesus did not prohibit the judgment of others. He only requires that our judgment be completely fair and that we only judge others by standard we would also like to be judged by. This is so important because many of us take this passage and we pass out judgment like we're passing out candy, you know. Maybe you think, oh, I'm good, I'm fair, all right, you get judged and you get judged and you over there, you get judged. And Jesus encouraged us to take uh, caution in this, though. When, When our judgment in regard to others is wrong, it's often not because we judge according to a standard, but because we are hypocritical in the application of that standard. We ignore the standard in our own life. It's common to judge others by one standard and ourselves by another standard, being far more generous to ourselves and others naturally. By judging others, you invite that same judgment upon yourself from others, and Jesus is cautioning us in that. Matthew Henry said this, No mercy shall be shown to the reputation of those that show no mercy to the reputation of others. The third thing, With the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. This is the principle upon which Jesus built this entire command. Judge not that you be not judged. God will measure unto us according to the same measure we use for others. Now, this is a powerful motivation for us to be generous with love, generous in things like forgiveness and mercy and goodness towards others. If we want more of those things from God, then absolutely we should give more of them to those around us. According to the teaching of some rabbis in Jesus' time, God had two measures that he used to judge people. One was a measure of justice, and the other was a measure of mercy. Whichever measure you want God to use, think about that. Whichever measure you want God to use with you, you've got to use that same measure with others. It's as simple as that. Now as we start getting into verse 3, Jesus began to lay out, he lays out a very interesting illustration. And so the, the fourth principle we're looking at now is, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't consider the plank in your own eye? Now, the figures of a speck and a plank are real figures, yet they're used humorous, humorously. You can almost sense the humor in this if you really look at it. Jesus shows how we are generally far more tolerant to our own sin than we are to the sin of other people around us. Though there might be a literal speck in somebody's eye, there obviously would not be a literal plank or a board in the eye of another person. Jesus used these exaggerated, almost humorous pictures to make his message easier to understand and more memorable to his audience. It's a humorous picture. It's a man with a big old board in his eye trying to help a friend with a tiny little speck in his eye. You can't think of the picture with almost bringing a smile to your face. An example of this, uh, of looking for a speck in the eye of another while ignoring the plank in one's own eye, is when the religious leaders brought the woman taken in adultery to Jesus. She had certainly sinned, but their sin was much worse, and Jesus exposed it as such with the statement, Hey, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone. That's in John 8, verse 7. Look, A plank is in your own eye, he says. Jesus indicates that the one with the plank in his own eye would not immediately be aware of it. He's blind to his obvious fault. It's the attempt to correct the fault of someone else when we ourselves have the same or even a greater fault. 
that earns the accusation that he says is a hypocrite. Now, a lot of you, like me, you have people in your lives that maybe just get on your nerves. And I don't know if you're like me, but I've caught myself recently saying prayers like, God, fix them. God, please heal him. God, touch him, Lord Jesus. Just fix him. Fix him or kill him. Something. Lord, take care of him. And all the time, every single time I've caught myself praying that prayer, God, fix him. He normally just responds back in a gentle way that only our Heavenly Father can. He says, hey, before we fix them, let's work on fixing you. And so that's, that's a really good principle to kind of keep in mind. Before I ask God to go and remove that tiny little speck in someone else's life, let me self-examine because I might have a board or a plank in my own eye that needs removed first. Before God can fix those around us, He often needs to start by fixing us first. And a lot of times when we begin fixing us, all the other stuff that bothers us that is around us will also be fixed. It's a pretty amazing principle if we learn to follow it. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus didn't say that it was wrong for us to help our brother with the speck in his eye. It is a good thing to help your brother with his speck. We all have blind spots that we need an extra set of eyes and someone to speak into our lives, but just make sure you deal with the plank in your own eye first. As we get to verse 6, we're given this instruction. The fifth principle is this. Do not give what is holy to the dogs or swine. Now, after he warned us against judgmental attitudes and self-blind criticism, Jesus here reminded us that he did not mean to imply that the people of his kingdom suspend all discernment. They must discern that there are some good, precious things that should not be given to those who will receive them with contempt. We might say that Jesus means don't be judgmental, but don't throw out all discernment either. The dogs and swine here are often understood as those who are hostile to the kingdom of God and the message that announces it. Our love for others must not blind us to their heart and rejection of the good news of the kingdom. Yet, we may also see this in the context of the previous words against hypocrites. It may be that in Jesus' mind, the dogs and swine represent hypocritical, judgmental believers. These sinning hypocrites should not be offered the pearls that belong to the community of the saints. Jesus also spoke in the context of correcting another brother or sister. Godly correction is a pearl. And though it may sting for a moment, that must not be cast before swine, which represents those that are determined not to receive it. Now we start making our way to the next section of this passage of Scripture, and we start to get more instructions for prayer. In verses 7 and 8, Jesus invites us to keep on asking, seeking, and knocking. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be open to you. It's one of my most favorite passages of Scripture. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. We see a progressive intensity in this passage, going from ask to seek to knock. And Jesus told us to have intensity, passion, and persistence in prayer. The fact that Jesus came back to the subject of prayer after already dealing with it in some depth in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, really kind of shows us the importance of prayer as he's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. In this threefold description of prayer as asking, seeking, and knocking, we see different aspects of prayer and we actually see different aspects of its reward. So prayer is like asking in that we simply make our requests known to God. And everyone who asks receives. Receiving is the reward for asking. Prayer is like seeking in that we search after God, His Word, and His will. And he who seeks finds. Finding is the reward of seeking. And prayer is like knocking until the door is opened. And we seek entrance into this great heavenly palace of our great King. Entering through the open door into His palace is the reward of knocking. And some might say the best reward of all. Adam Clark said this, he said, Ask with confidence and humility, seek with care and application, and knock with earnestness and perseverance. The idea of knocking also implies that we sense some resistance from time to time. 
After all, if the door were already open, there'd be no need to knock. We'd barrel right through it. Yet Jesus encouraged us, even when you sense that the door is closed, you must knock. Then do so and continue to do so and you will be answered. I love that promise. Now with that in mind, I want to pause right here for a second because some of you watching this today, you may be standing at the door and you may be knocking for a door to open in your life and it doesn't want to seem to open. Maybe you're knocking on the door for a new job. Maybe you're asking for a lost loved one to return to Jesus. Maybe you're knocking for healing. Whatever it may be, let this be a reminder to you today to just keep on knocking. Nothing is happening. Just keep knocking. Nobody's answering. Just keep knocking. Because when we knock, the great promise is this, that that door will be open. Charles Spurgeon said this, His doors are meant to open. They were made on purpose for entrance. And so the blessed gospel of God is made on purpose for you to enter into life and peace. It would be of no use to knock at a wall, but you may wisely knock at a door, for it is arranged for opening. I love that. See, we come to God's door, and all we must do is knock today. If it were locked, we'd feel the need to break in, but it isn't necessary. All we must do is knock. And even if I don't have the skills necessary to break in, I can still knock. I know enough to do that. Another great Spurgeon quote is this, any, un, un, any uneducated man can knock if that is all which is required of him. A man can knock though he may not be a philosopher. A dumb man can knock. A blind man can knock. With a palsied hand a man may knock. The way to open heaven's gate is wonderfully simplified to those who are lowly enough to follow the Holy Spirit's guidance and ask, seek, and knock believingly. God has not provided a salvation which can only be understood by learned men. It is intended for the ignorant, the short-witted, and the dying, as well as for, for others, and hence it must be as plain as knocking at a door. See, God promises an answer to the one who diligently seeks Him. Many of our passionless prayers are not answered for good reason, because it's almost as if we ask God to care about something that we care little or nothing about. As we continue to verse 9, Jesus then illustrates the giving nature of God in the seventh principle. Let's look at it. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? And he gives a couple of other great illustrations. Jesus makes it clear that God doesn't have to be persuaded or appeased in prayer. He wants, listen to me, he wants to give us not just bread, but even more than what we ask for. Instead, in comparison to even the best human father, how much more is God a good and loving father to you today? Be reminded of that. Finally, in verse 12, Jesus brings this section home. And he says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The eighth principle and the final principle we'll dive into today is this. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. The golden rule. See, the negative way of stating this command was known long before Jesus. It had long been said this way, you should not do to your neighbor what you would not want him to do to you. But it's a significant advance for Jesus to put it in the positive way, to say that we should do unto others what we would want them to do unto us. From there, Jesus shows that this simple principle, the golden rule, summarizes all the law and the prophets say about how we should treat other people. If we would simply treat others the way we would want to be treated, we would naturally obey all the law says about our relationships with other people. Brings it all to a close with that statement. Another great Charles Spurgeon quote is this, Oh, that all men acted on it, and there would be no slavery, no war, no swearing, no striking, no lying, no robbing, but all would be justice and love. <laughs> what a kingdom is this which has such a law. I love it. So we covered a lot today, and I want to recap each principle, and I want to, I want to leave you with these questions. With every principle we've covered, all eight, 
There's eight questions that I want to leave for you today, and I want you to think on these things, write them down, meditate on them, pray over them, and allow the Holy Spirit to do something in your life as you ask yourself these questions. Am I judging or condemning too harshly? Think about it. When it comes to applying fair judgment to others, what is the condition of my own heart? Thirdly, am I measuring judgment with justice and mercy? The fourth question, have I considered the plank that may be in my own eye, and am I allowing God to fix me before I ask Him to fix others? Is the type of correction I may be offering considered godly? Is it coming from a pure place? And the next question is this. Have I stopped asking, seeking, or knocking? Have you given up too soon? Next is how much more is God a good and loving Father? Now this, this question is phrased a little differently because some of you just need to think about that. Maybe you have a bad experience with an earthly father. Or maybe you have an amazing experience. Whatever that experience is, I want you to look through a different lens in that if your earthly father has taken care of you or even rejected you, how much more does your heavenly father care about every single aspect of your life? And some of you need to hear that today. And you need to, you need to just sit in that for a second. How much more... Is God a good and loving Father? And the final question I leave with you is this. Am I treating others the way I wish to be treated? I feel like if we were to ask ourselves that question daily, the world around us would look a whole lot different. So think on those things today. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this time we've had together. I thank you for this teaching that thousands of years later is still impacting thousands and thousands of lives. I pray today, Lord, that we would change our perspective on people around us. And Father, yeah, we'd be fruit inspectors, but God, we would do it in a, a pure justice, mercy-driven kind of a way that, that, Lord, we would just treat others the way we would want to be treated and we would be filled with your presence and your love, your unconditional love, as we go about our day-to-day -day lives, as we surround ourselves with people. Lord, I pray, Father, for those that may be watching this that are asking, seeking, and knocking. That, Lord, some of them, they, they need to ask and they need to receive. They've been seeking and they need to find. And some of them are knocking and knocking and knocking and that door needs to be opened. And by faith, we believe that in your timing, all of that's going to take place because you promise it will. So, Father, we lay everything we're going through today at your feet, knowing that we can trust you, that, Lord, as we ask, seek, and knock, you're right there, ready to respond. We love you so much, Lord, and thank you for this time we've had to spend together today. Thank you for being a loving Father that loves us so much, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.